Hi, I'm Michael. This is Lessons from the Screenplay. True Detective and Seven share a number of similarities. They both feature an investigation into a disturbing series of murders. They both bring their characters and the audience face to face with some of the worst horrors imaginable. And they both have themes which are ultimately optimistic in nature. So today I want to talk about how these themes are an integral part of the narratives, how they are expressed in the beliefs of the main characters, their partners, and the serial killers they are hunting, and examine how exploring the darkest parts of humanity can allow us to see the light. Let's take a look at True Detective and Seven. In her book, Creating Character Arcs, author K.M. Weiland discusses the important connection between character arc and theme. Not only does character arc directly influence story structure, it is also a direct influence on theme. In some respects, we might even go so far as to say that character arc equals theme. So before we examine character arc, let's establish each story's theme. There are many ideas explored in both True Detective and Seven as they ponder morality and religion and philosophy. But I think there is one central theme that is reflected in the main character's arcs and influences the story structure. At the beginning of the November 1st, 1994 draft of Seven, there is a quote from Ernest Hemingway, which eventually became the last line of the film. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. I think these lines concisely summarize the theme of both Seven and True Detective. The world is not a fine place. It's filled with inescapable pain and terrible people. But there is also good, and at the end of the day, it's worth fighting for. So now that we have an idea of what the theme is, let's examine how it relates to character arc, beginning with the beliefs of the protagonist. Where are you headed? Far away from here. Somerset has become cynical. He's repulsed by the apathy he sees every day in his city, and he believes that he can't go on fighting any longer. In True Detective, Rustin Cole very clearly expresses his nihilistic, anti-natalist perspective. I think the honorable thing for our species to do is deny our programming, stop reproducing, walk hand in hand into extinction. At the beginning of their stories, Cole has embraced his pessimism, and Somerset has succumbed to apathy. But why are they this way? There's always some experience that has shaped a character's beliefs. This is often called the character's ghost. A character's ghost, also referred to as their wound, is something in their past that haunts them. In their book, The Negative Trait Thesaurus, Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi point out that Wounds are often kept secret from others because embedded within them is the lie, an untruth that the character believes about himself. Self-blame and feelings of shame are usually deeply embedded within the lie, generating fears that compel him to change his behavior in order to keep from being hurt again. Both Cole and Somerset have ghosts that feed into their pessimistic beliefs, and both have to do with their children. You believe in ghosts? Two-thirds of the way through Seven, Tracy, Detective Mills' wife, asks to meet with Somerset. They discuss her hatred of living in the city and her recently discovered pregnancy. Somerset then reveals the only specific piece of his backstory that we learn about, his ghost. I had a relationship once. It was very much like a marriage. I remember thinking, how can I bring a child into a world like this? How How can a person grow up with all this around them? The conflict within his ghost is directly tied to his struggle with the theme. Then comes the part of his ghost that haunts him. I told her I didn't want to have it. And over the next few weeks, I wore her down. In this final part of the scene, we see a glimpse of the lie within his ghost. I'm positive that I made the right decision. But there's not a day that passes that I don't wish that I had made a different choice. The inherent contradiction in these lines demonstrates how Somerset is struggling with his beliefs, with the theme. In True Detective, Cole's ghost also has to do with the loss of a child. I was married, Marty, for three years. We had a 
Baby girl, she died. Car accident, she was two years old. And just like with Somerset, Cole's ghost contains traces of the lie he's telling himself. You know, I think about my daughter now. You know what? What she was spared. Sometimes I feel grateful. In struggling with the pain of losing his child, Cole has managed to twist this loss into something he's grateful for. And in order to feel like your child was spared the burden of existence, one has to believe that existence is a burden. The ghosts for both Cole and Somerset establish a clear reason why they believe what they believe, and hint that somewhere deep inside, they both know that they're lying to themselves. With these starting beliefs established, it's the story's job to send them on a journey of change. And in both Seven and True Detective, one of the biggest keys to their change is their partners. At this point, it's become almost cliche for two characters who can't stand each other to be partnered up, but it's a great way to generate conflict. And when it's done well, it's not just that the characters can't stand each other because of behavioral odd couple traits, it's because they have intrinsically different values. This allows their conflict to be a discussion of theme. In Seven, Somerset and Mills have very different outlooks on the world. After all his years on the force, Somerset is quitting to get away from this place. While Mills... You actually fought to get reassigned here. I've just never seen it done that way before. I thought I could do some good. Slowly, Mills helps rekindle Somerset's passion, reminding him why he finds value in being a cop. Until finally, toward the end of the second act, Mills calls him out on the lie he believes. You say that the problem with people is that they don't care. So I don't care about people. That makes no sense. I don't think you're quitting because you believe these things you say. I don't. I think you want to believe them because you're quitting. This gets to Somerset. It shakes his beliefs ever so slightly, enough that he takes his metronome the device we've seen him use to block out the world, a symbol of apathy, and throws it across the room, destroying it. Just as in Seven, Cole and Hart do not get along at all. Tom, I think you hit a ceiling and you just keep raising the bar. You are like the Michael Jordan of being a son of a bitch. Throughout the series, Hart serves to show Cole that there are other ways to look at life. Are you funny, Marty? Shit you get soft about. But it's not necessarily the partner's job to convince the main character that their beliefs are wrong. In fact, the main character's beliefs should be so strong that words alone won't move them. And hearts definitely do not move Cole. I just want you to stop saying odd shit, like you smell a psychosphere or you're in someone's faded memory of a town. Just stop. Uh, given how long it's taken for me to reconcile my nature, I can't figure I'd forgo it on your account, Marty. It's only by truly overcoming the antagonist that the protagonist changes. And True Detective demonstrates this in an interesting way. It gives the characters a false victory. Cole and Hart think they've gotten the killer in 1995. And afterward, they each have a period that Marty describes as pretty good for a while. But it's not happily ever after because their journeys aren't complete yet the real killer is still out there. Both Cole and Hart have gotten what they wanted, but not what they needed. By 2012, Hart even seems to have realized this, as he says, You know, I cleaned up, but maybe I didn't change. Not the way I needed to. This false victory is one of the great benefits of the limited series format. Seven takes place over seven days, True Detective takes place over 17 years. Seven is a two-hour film. True Detective is a story told over eight hours. This extra time allows for the two characters to have a falling out, go their separate ways for a decade, and then reunite to finish what they began 17 years ago. And in order to finish it, they must overcome the antagonist. As Nick Pizzolatto, writer of True Detective, says of the finale, I thought we could make room for one more point of view the dark mirror to our characters. On the spectrum of thematic orientation, Somerset and Cole's partners are the opposite of them. 
But the beliefs of the antagonists, the serial killers that they are chasing, are in many ways similar to the protagonists. We see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. We tolerate it because it's common, it's, it's trivial. We tolerate it morning, noon, and night. Both Somerset and John Doe are disgusted by what they see in the city and people's apathy toward it. <laughs> Similarly, the serial killer and true detective, Errol Childress, has shades of coal in him. He's not a dumb, out-of-control murderer. He's self-educated and seemingly well-versed in philosophy. My ascension removes me from the disc in the loop. This is a reference to the flat circle idea first introduced in the series by Reggie Ledoux back in 1995. You'll do this again. Time is a flat circle. I said, Nietzsche, shut the fuck up. In regards to this flat circle idea, Nick Pizzolatto explains that Childress believes the murders ritually enacted over a period of time upon his death permit him an ascension that removes him from the karmic wheel of rebirth. Childress wants to ascend and escape this existence. And Cole has always been struggling with the virtue of existence. And by the end of the series, there are moments that suggest that he's ready to die. My life's been a circle of violence and degradation. As long as I can remember, I'm ready to tie it off. Both Rustin Cole and Errol Childress believe that existence on its own is not enough and want to escape this life one way or another. Having the protagonists come face to face with what is, in some ways, an extreme version of themselves is a way to force them to reevaluate their beliefs. So as they go into act three, there is only one thing left, the final battle. Seven has, in my opinion, one of the most suspenseful climaxes of all time. As Somerset and Mills drive out into the middle of nowhere, it seems impossible to guess how John Doe could win given his situation. And what happens next leads to one of the most famous scenes in film history. What's gun. in the fucking box? Give me the gun. He just told you. While the scene is masterfully crafted for suspense, it's the last decision made by Mills that allows Somerset to complete his arc. <laughs> there were actually several different versions of this ending. For example, in one draft I read, Somerset kills John Doe before Mills can pull the trigger. This, apparently, was done to try to make Somerset feel more active during these final moments. But I feel this would have robbed the film of the true completion of Somerset's arc, which occurs in the final scene where Mills is driven off. The captain asks Somerset, Where are you gonna be? And Somerset, despite all he's experienced with Mills and witnessing John Doe's scheme go exactly as planned, says, Around. I'll be around. In fact, it's not despite what he's experienced, but because of what he's experienced, that Somerset is changed. His beliefs have been moved, not even toward total optimism, but simply to the point where he won't give in to apathy. And with his arc completed, the theme is fully expressed. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. On your knees now! No. In the final battle of True Detective, Cole pursues the killer into the tunnels and is invited deeper into the twisted mind of Childress. Come on inside, little priest. Cole is stabbed and a fight ensues in which Hart saves Cole's life, and Cole saves Hart's. The horrific journey that these two men have been on was littered with suffering for many people. But in the end, they did what they needed to do, and they found some kind of catharsis. And through this catharsis, Cole changes. It's just one story. The oldest, light versus dark. Here's to me that the dark has a lot more territory. And in the last lines of True Detective, Cole corrects Hart in a manner that suggests a dramatic shift in belief and fully expresses the theme. You know, you're looking at her wrong. It's 
guy, I think. How's that? Well, once there was only dark. Yes, the lights went out. Examining True Detective and Seven shows how having a clear understanding of your theme can guide the decisions you make when creating your story. And that when the design of the characters, arcs, and setting serve the theme, it provides a cohesion that makes for enjoyable and powerful narratives. I sometimes step back and think about the value of stories like these. I wonder why I enjoy films and shows that explore the absolute worst parts of humanity, the atrocities that we can inflict on each other. But I think the True Detective and Seven use these awful experiences to tell a tale of profound optimism. They show us that someone can be subjected to the worst of humanity, and rather than fall victim to it, come out the other side with an even stronger resolve to keep fighting. To not give in to apathy. To make sure the light keeps winning. Hey guys! You may have noticed that I've mentioned the book Creating Character Arcs by K.M. Wyland a couple times now. I've been really enjoying it. She does a great job of explaining how to make sure your characters and plot structure and theme are all intertwined. And because this video has been sponsored by Audible, you can get the audiobook for free by going to audible.com LFTS and starting a free trial. What's great about Audible is that they have a ton of books to choose from, including several of the other books that I've mentioned in previous videos. So if you want a free audiobook and you want to support this channel, just go to audible.com LFTS to begin a 30-day free trial and start listening today. I also want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. When I started this channel, I didn't know how long I'd be able to do it for, but because of you guys, it's been a year since my first video, so thank you. If you want to support this channel on Patreon, you can by clicking on the link below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.